All right. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, spring edition. Uh, let's pretend it's spring a virtual quant marketing seminar. Uh, to kick us off today, uh, we have Ken Wilbur from UCSD, uh, who will be talking about uh, gratuities and uh, digital service marketplace. Uh, as usual, uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A tool uh, and we'll make sure to ask uh, these questions. Uh, panelists can uh, ask questions at any time. Thank you so much for being with us, Ken. Uh, thank you so much um, to you, Ayala, to all the organizers and to everyone for coming. Um, I'm very excited to solicit your feedback on this work. Um, this is joint work with uh, Sung, uh, who is on um, part of the panel, and On Amir, uh, mostly Sung, uh, to the extent that I feel a little bit, um, I, I was reluctant to present this, um, but you know, you, you present things for various reasons, right? Sometimes it's to, to advertise, uh, but in this case, it's more to solicit feedback. Um, we've gotten some constructive criticism on this paper. Uh, one of the most challenging um, comments that we've gotten is um, uh, around uh, the theoretical framework um, that, that we're thinking about. And, um, you know, I, I have to confess, I, I approached this topic with, I, I, thought it, I thought it was appropriate to sort of approach this with somewhat flat priors. Um, and, and so that makes uh, any, any input, input we can get is helpful. We're actively revising, um, but, but especially around theory, um, we're, we're sort of soliciting that. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend about five, seven minutes to introduce the topic uh, before diving into the, into the research. And, and I'll pause for questions um, bef before uh, going deeper on slide nine. So um, digital platforms and marketplaces are becoming um, pervasive in our economy. And there are different ways to look at that. But one of them is to look at the labor force. And... Uh, in a recent survey, Pew Research found that one out of every six American adults uh, who responded to the survey said that they had done gig work, and 9% uh, of them had done that within the previous 12 months, and about 5% of the respondents said it had been their main job within the past year. Now, maybe that's inflated by the pandemic. This was in late 2021, but still, this is a, a really important and growing um, uh, means by which buyers and sellers uh, find each other. Now, something that's hard to know from outside is how much are these people making, especially per hour? There's a labor relations um, office in the Illinois state government that made a serious effort to understand this, and they surveyed um, drivers for uh, transportation apps and based on their um, answers about revenues and financial costs and time spent, they, they worked out the distribution of hourly wages. And, and what they found was about 40% of drivers were making less than the effective uh, minimum wage. Um, and, and if you ask these drivers why they're driving for, for mainly Uber and Lyft, um, about a quarter of them say that they, they like doing it. Um, another quarter give uh, various answers related to the attributes of the job, but almost half of them say they're doing it because they have to, um, because they don't get enough money uh, from their other job, because they can't find another job, or they've um, relatively few of them say uh, uh, they've, they've faced um, job-based discrimination, um, although there are, are other platforms where it seems um, reasonable to believe that uh, many of the sellers or providers are, are on the platform because they have faced discrimination in labor markets. Now, um, in part uh, based on their own profit motive and in part based on concern over worker compensation, some of the platforms uh, tried to directly increase provider income by soliciting extra payments from consumers. And um, they do this in a variety of ways. They're, they're sort of all over the map, and, and there is no standard way in which they solicit um, gratuities or, or tips. And, and so Uber says, add a tip, and they, they name the driver. Um, Lyft uh, says, add tip. Uh, Grubhub says, select a tip amount. Uh, DoorDash says, dash your tip. Um, TaskRabbit 
uh, shows the default tips and, and then afterwards says tips are optional. Um, YouTube calls this a super thanks and um, Clubhouse uh, just says send money. Um, and of course, there are lots of platforms that do not solicit tips. So putting all this together to show the variation in the um, tip request messages we see in the marketplace. Um, you know, when when tip requests are designed as part of digital interfaces, um, it, it changes the nature uh, of of the transaction, right? So before um, payments were digitally mediated, we had a tip jar, we, we had maybe a sign. Um, sometimes uh, in the old days, we used to leave the money on the table. And, um, and, and now tips are actively requested and, and um, the, the proportion of transactions in which they are actively requested has, has risen substantially. Now, now, sometimes they're requested before the service is rendered, which may change the, the nature of um, the role they play. Um, but it, but I, I think it's, um, it's fair to say that all of us are encountering these tip requests much more often than, than we used to. So I... Um, to, to narrow this in a little bit to what specifically we're going to be doing, we're gonna we're gonna ask sort of an existence proof. Can platforms appeal to specific tipping motivations in their tip request in order to change tipping rates? And and we're gonna find uh, the answer is yes uh, for some tipping motivation and 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 no for another uh, tipping motivation. Um, secondly, we're gonna think about trying to develop uh, an empirical framework that platforms can use to. Uh, measure the consequences of um, designing tip requests because an intervention that increases tipping while decreasing sales actually could work against uh, the platform and its sellers. Um, we also need to think about um, substitution between tips and ratings. Um, and, and finally, uh, the, the third question that we're working on but won't have um, much in the way of results for today is looking at buyer and seller um, and product category moderators of, um, of, of uh, compliance with tipping requests. Um, I, I think there are a lot of, even though this is maybe, has not often been studied in quantitative marketing, it has been studied in other contexts. Um, it, it's really sort of an interesting cross section of fields that that Mike, uh, Mike Lynn has been swimming in and for the, the past couple of decades, um, psychology, uh, economics, um, sociology to some degree. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about directly affecting um, income earned by vulnerable uh, gig workers. Um, we, we can also think about the indirect um, effects of tip requests. If to, to the extent that tips um, incentivize and reward service effort, or customization, uh, they may improve the, the quality of the transactions that the platform facilitates and, and thereby may improve repatronage or, or uh, affect prices. Um, I see this as a um, an example of uh, something I, I, I think about as platform analytics. Uh, I, I think quant marketing is in a good place to um, think about how to use data to better design platforms and understand them and, and um, you know, we're hosting a workshop <laughs> on that topic in San Diego in a couple of months. I'd love to see some of you there. Um, and and uh, we're analyzing consequences of, of a nudge. Um, we, we do find some consequences, but we also find um, uh, limitations and, and a great deal of uncertainty about what those consequences are. Um, now, there also may be some interest that some reasons that you might not be interested in this. Um, one is that the experiment we're going to report uh, had a had a design flaw. Um, we think we can get around it using some post experimental data. Um, we we also can't argue that we tested the optimal treatments, and and we're not going to argue that we have external validity. Um, and in fact, I, I I truly believe that the optimal tip request is something that will be platform specific. Um, and 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 so we think about this more as a, a call for more platforms to test. Uh, tip requests that appeal to specific tipping motivations, um, more so than trying to create externally valid research using a field experiment. Um, this is probably uh, a, a good place to pause. Um, 
if anybody has any questions. Uh, one question uh, from the audience is around um, the, uh, have you, based on the examples, there seemed to be kind of a nudge to increase tips by giving people the options of like 18, 20, 22, or uh, things like that. Have you also uh, looked at this? I'm going to give you a little bit of evidence on that. I'm not sure um, we have the best evidence in the literature. Um, uh, and I'm going to talk about three papers um, that, four, four papers that, that have looked at this directly. Um, and, and so I've got good references for you, in, including a couple of people who are on the call. So, so the, um, yeah, uh, any other uh, questions or comments before I go on? So Ken, let me ask you, maybe maybe this question can be withheld for some time. So I was debating about that. So the attribution of the tipping amount becomes critical, right? If it is attributed to the firm, then it is a price increase in some sense. If it is attributed to the tipper as being or the provider being independent of the firm, then then that's a that's a different kind of a I don't know what it is, but it'll be a different kind of attribution in some sense. And the customer may basically uh, look at it differently. And by, by saying David, you're basically making it salient that it is the, the provider and that specific provider. So, so I wanted to hold off because I'm not sure whether your experiment gets into that part or not, but you did mention the trade-offs between a price increase, which basically says a loading of the demand versus some other kind of a attribution, which may not necessarily lower demand. So, Yeah, semantics will be important here. Tips are voluntary payments to service providers. Um, uh, we would contrast this with a service fee. Um, which would not be voluntary, um, which a lot of restaurants have been adding on to their menus due to increases in labor costs and, and, and labor scarcity, right? Um, and and uh, uh, Raja, I, I'd like to hold the, the rest of that question until I show you the treatments that, that we're going to be looking at um, and I have to come back to it. Um, so uh, I, I see the tipping literature. Um, uh, there, there have been a lot of studies. Um, it, uh, really sort of um, from different perspectives. So um, in thinking about tipping motivation, one uh, straightforward way to understand why people voluntarily uh, give extra money to service providers is to ask them. And um, there's an economist in Israel named um, Azar. He uh, ran a survey of about 340 people and, and, and asked them, gave them multiple choices on, on why they gave tips and um, the average respondent gave 3.4 reasons. Um, and, and the most common were uh, tipping being a social norm, uh, showing gratitude to servers, waiters depend on tips, and, and I don't want to feel guilty. So, um, you know, I think we have to take people's stated motivations um, with a bit of salt. Uh, but uh, I, I, I like this simple, straightforward evidence because um, we, we, I don't think we should be thinking about this as, as, a, as a simple phenomenon. I, I don't think there's a single reason. Um, uh, Mike uh, has a very nice um, theoretical article in 2015, which summarized the large body of literature before then and uh, proposed there are five main reasons that people give tips. They want to help servers. They want to reward them for providing service. They want to pay for and, and help to arrange better future service. Um, there, there's, a, there's an element of um, purchasing social esteem or avoiding a social penalty. And, and finally, there's a, there's a sense of duty. Um, and uh, one of the things I, I, I like best about this paper, it, it changed the way I thought about this phenomenon that, you know, um, these these norms can can come about um, within marketplaces, right? So servers are deciding where to allocate their effort. And so um, one of the uh, explanations for the um, development of tipping customs was that some customers started paying extra in order to gain preferential service. And then it became necessary. Uh, servers started expecting those extra payments and giving increasingly better service to those who paid and withholding better service from those who didn't until uh, everyone found that they had to pay in order to um, get to a, a baseline level of service. And, and these things evolved. So when I was waiting tables in the 90s, uh, the standard was a 15% tip um, and 18% was really good. 
And then when I was waiting tables in the 2000s, the in grad school, the, the standard was a 20% tip and 25% was like not that big a deal. Um, so even during our lifetimes, these things are, are moving. Um, and, and these customs can become uh, habits, right? So, you know, if, if you've ever left a tip after receiving poor service, uh, <laughs> that can show you how, how, how strongly ingrained um, these habits can, can become. And, and Mike's follow-up article the, the following year took this theory to data, um, surveyed uh, 300 and some people about their tipping frequency in a variety of contexts and um, tipping motivations in each of those contexts and performed a principal components analysis and, and grouped tipping motivations into four categories, one being service and esteem, a second being altruistic motives, um, a third being a duty, and a fourth being reciprocity, re rewarding the service um, provided. Now, on the other side of the literature, um, we're, there's a lot of um, good recent work uh, looking at um, digitally mediated uh, tips and, and tips in digitally mediated contexts. And, and um, uh, two papers, um, including, including Kwabana, uh, who's on the panel, um, have analyzed New York City uh, taxi tipping, where the, the credit card machine gives you these options and, and the compliance is almost universal. Um, and and uh, both papers uh, show that the, the menu of defaults is um, an important determinant of um, how big of a tip is left. Uh, again, the, the extensive margin doesn't move a lot, but, but the intensive margin can, can change with the defaults, it's very clear. Now contrast that with um, a working paper uh, run by um, some famous economists and some staff at Uber. Um, and, and even though Uber and taxis offer um, ostensibly similar services, the, the, the tipping rate is dramatically different. So only about one out of six Uber rides are tipped. And um, they ran a field experiment on, on the, the default tips and, and they found um, in, in their words, um, defaults affect the tip levels but are much less powerful than in the taxi cab industry. And um, their speculation, which I don't think they were able to rigorously prove using the data they had available, was that because the tips were left after the rider left the driver's presence, the interpersonal motivations were, were less um, powerful. Um, and then uh, Alexander Boone and Lynn looked at uh, tips left in an app for a laundry service and found that uh, changing the, the tip menu, um, again, changed the um, size of the tips, uh, but did not change um, post-tipping outcomes, or, or at least didn't significantly change those. Um, so uh, to wrap up the literature review, um, a couple of papers have looked at um, digitally intermediated contexts, and, and each of these makes a very nice point, I think. Um, Doheim and Wessner found that um, uh, purchasers pay bigger tips or are more likely to tip um, platform employees than autonomous gig workers. Um, uh, Chanadal found that, that ratings are a way for buyers to reward servers and, and they can substitute for tips, and so they, they argued for uh, requesting tips before requesting ratings in platform design. And um, uh, Raj and, and his co-authors, excuse me, um, uh, found in the context of live streaming that, that when the reported audience size um, is larger or smaller, the, the tip rate can, can rise or fall compared to an intermediate audience size. Um, so I, I take this um, as a evidence that, that tipping responds to, to features of the digital context, but um, I, I, I haven't found yet any papers um, that directly appealed to the, to the tipping motivations that, that Mike has worked on in um, requesting uh, buyers to pay tips. And, and, and so that's um, gonna be, I think, one of the um, uh, ce central um, uh, uh, claims of, of this paper. So, um, in order to, to introduce that, I'm, I'm gonna uh, briefly talk about the empirical context and give some descriptives, then I'll talk about the experiment design and, and, and then the results. So um, we're looking at Fiverr, which um, started out as a low cost labor market. It, it later moved up market. Um, 
And, and the buyer goes through basically sort of a four-stage funnel. The first is um, searching or browsing the directory uh, in order to um, find a, a service provider listing that looks promising. Um, uh, we're, we're generally talking about freelance business-to-business -business services. Um, some of the biggest ones are graphic design, copy editing, translation, and um, digital marketing. Um, when the buyer finds a, a seller, um, they can correspond with that seller. The correspondence typically involves um, buyer-specific requirements and um, delivery dates. Um, if the if the buyer purchases, they pay the platform. The seller the, the platform then commissions the work from the seller. Uh, when the seller finishes the work, um, the delivery is done through the platform. The buyer confirms that the work. Uh, matched um, their expectations, and and then the platform releases the the payment to the seller, and then Im immediately upon confirmation, the the platform asks the buyer first to rate the seller on a five star scale, and and then to uh, give a tip, and that tip request uh, before the experiment looked like this, and it said, "Would you like to leave a tip to seller name?" And this um, use of the seller name was a, a, a platform policy. They, they tried to promote a friendly environment by, by emphasizing usernames. And for um, relatively low price gigs, um, they, they gave five and $10 defaults or a custom. For, for prices over $25, they gave 20 and 30% defaults or, or a custom tip. Is the empirical context pretty clear? Any, any? Okay, great. Um, so uh, we're going to start out just by showing a couple of um, descriptives from the pre-experiment data. Um, we've, we've got uh, data from the calendar year of 2019. Um, and, and so before the experiment ran, it started in June, um, we're looking at 4 million or so transactions. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to show you just a couple of key facts that sort of motivate the analysis. The, the first is that overall, in the pre-experiment data, about 8% of um, gigs were tipped. So we're, we're looking at a relatively low tip rate. So tips are somewhat anomalous. The platform wanted to try to create a tipping norm, and, and so the platform was focused on increasing tipping overall. Um, and uh, most of what I show you is going to be based on the number of tips uh, that were given in a given condition. Um, most of the results replicate to other measures like the dollar tip or the percentage tip, but some of the results do not. Um, none of the, if we change the, the outcome measure, none of the results would flip, but some of them lose significance because the tip amounts are sometimes much more variable. Um, you see these mass points uh, in the distribution of the tip percentage, and that's because a lot of the gigs are priced in $5 increments. And we had those. Um, we had a twenty percent default, and we had a, a five and ten dollar default, and and that's what gives these huge mass points in in the distribution of, of the tips. Um, one of our first questions was, uh, how important is the buyer or the seller uh, culture, tip, tipping culture, in determining the tip? And um, I I think these descriptives tell it um, pretty clearly that. Um, Buyers from uh, cultures that have frequent restaurant tipping norms uh, seem to tip a lot more often, but they don't tip more often to sellers from the same culture. And buyers from other cultures do not tip uh, North American sellers appreciably more often than they tip other cultures. And so we see no evidence of like a tourism, uh, uh, this was own, uh, Sung's, Sung's uh, term, a tourist effect uh, where you try to match the local custom or, or even an interaction effect um, in, in tipping culture. Um, we also find, as has been found in some other contexts, that uh, tipping does tend to uh, be more common after um, uh, buyers indicate uh, satisfaction. Um, it doesn't rule out the possibility that, that, that ratings and tips are substitutes for each other. Of course, this is just a descriptive. Um, but but it does uh, it does seem to be consistent with the idea that um, uh, tipping could uh, potentially uh, incentivize um, service quality, although we're not um, actually going to find evidence for that. And finally, I'm 
I'm, I'm going to show you some descriptive evidence that um, buyer factors have an enormous um, uh, uh, ability to explain tipping um, compared to seller factors. And so um, if so, I'm going to take out the single transaction buyers and sellers and a, across a range of specifications that I don't have time to show you. Um, the 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 buyer region, which I showed you a, a, an effect that looked pretty big in that graphic, it explains um, just over 1% of the variation in, in tipping. Um, if I replace buyer region with buyer fixed effects, um, we get up to about 40%. Um, if instead of replacing uh, buyer characteristics like region with fixed effects, I, I replace seller characteristics with seller fixed effects, we only get about 3% extra. And, and so empirically speaking, uh, to, a, to a first approximation, buyer factors explain about 10 times as much variation in tipping as seller factors. So I um, have a question about that. Mm -hmm. it, and I'm sorry that my math's not real good, but isn't that just a function of the relative numbers? There are 10 times as many buyers as sellers. And if you're basically fixed effects of creating dummy variables, might this difference be largely attributable to those differences in numbers? Right. So that's the idea between R square and adjusted R square, right? So okay. adjusted R square is the common um, model fit statistic that uh, penalizes the model for becoming more complex for including a much larger uh, number of um, fixed effects. But um, I take your point that another way to show this would be to look at um, similarly large buyers and similarly large sellers. And within that narrower context where it's maybe more of a, a fair comparison to, to, to do something similar, I'm, I'm quite confident that the qualitative conclusion will be similar, but um, we haven't done that. So, so I take the question and um, uh, that's something that we can do. Thanks. Uh, now, the reason I'm showing you this is because um, when we look at repeat buyers, we're going to um, think it's very important to control for buyer factors, and therefore we're going to do so in a difference in difference design, which, which is maybe not so common in digital experiments. But um, uh, next up, we're going to talk about the, the field experiment. Um, and and there, are, there were two um, constraints that affected this field experiment. The first was that the the firm's testing um, apparatus was limited to four conditions. So we can do up to A, B, C, D, but we cannot do A, B, C, D, E. Um, so uh, that, that limited the, the number of conditions we could test. Uh, we couldn't do like a two by three or a two by four. Um, so uh, the, the status quo message was an obvious control to include in there. The treatment that we most wanted to test was this injunctive norm saying it's customary to leave a tip uh, for the seller's services. Um, the, the injunctive norm is not specific to a seller, and therefore we did not want to include the seller's name in that message. And that was controversial inside the company, um, given this past history of trying to promote a, a friendly environment with seller names. Um, we also wanted to test reciprocity um, and, and so the, the compromise solution we came to was testing a reciprocity message with and another one without the seller name. Um, those messages looked like this. Uh, what we um, call implicit reciprocity is show your appreciation to your seller by giving a tip. Implicit both because we don't give the seller's name and we don't give a, a detailed reason why you should give a tip. Um, a second condition called reciprocity, where we say, leave your seller name a tip to show your appreciation for a job well done. And then what we call a norm, it's customary to leave a tip for the seller's service. Now, I, I just want to briefly connect these three treatments back to some earlier literature. Um, recall uh, Mike's 2016 paper categorizing reason, reasons for tipping as service esteem, altruism, duty, or reciprocity. And recall that difference in the, in the transportation tipping rate, which was hypothesized to be because of the absence of interpersonal contact at the time of tipping. Putting those two things together, the reason that we focused on testing reciprocity and norms is that we predicted 
that service esteem and altruistic motives would be less powerful in this context of no face-to-face -face interaction at all at any point in the service and asynchronous service delivery and tip request. So that's why we thought the duty and the reciprocity were the two avenues to go. I'm, I'm not going to claim we've tested the optimal treatments, um, but uh, this is what we tested and this is what we're able to report. Now, the second attribute of the field experiment was included by the CFO. Um, uh, so um, we succeeded in getting them to shut down all other tests during a four-week period, um, but, but we didn't succeed in getting them to postpone this uh, aspect of the test. So um, the CFO had a pretty clear sense from tipping data that um, their tip menus were not optimal. And so what he wanted to do was um, to test a, a three-condition default um, uh, rather than, than their legacy two condition default. Now, uh, I'm going to show you the defaults and why they were chosen in just a moment. But, but first, I just want to I just want to set your expectations. The bigger the change in defaults, the bigger the effect of a change in defaults. Suppose we took that $5 tip default and replaced it with a $500 tip default. Well, the usage of that default would go to zero unless people just didn't notice the change or clicked it by accident. On the contrary, suppose we took that 30% default and moved it to 30.01%. I don't think we would expect that to have a large change on tipping behavior. So let me show you the usage of the defaults on Fiverr before the experiment. Now we've uh, binned transactions by price bucket below $25, it was around 70% of buyers that were using the $5 default button, around 20% of buyers that were using the, the $10 default, and around 10% of buyers that were entering a custom tip. Now within those 10% of custom tips, I'm showing that you the distribution of custom tips within each price bucket, and 15 was the modal tip. And so what the CFO decided to do was to include a third default tip at $15 at low price points. Now at higher price points, the blue line is the usage of the 20% default tip. And you can, I'm sorry, the red line is, is the 20% default tip. And that tended to fall a little bit at higher price points. The green line is the usage of the 30% default tip. It was practically zero at all price points, and the blue is the custom. And so what the CFO decided to do was to take out the option that almost no one was using and to replace it with 15 and 25%, which are closer to the neighborhood of the default that some people were using. The distributions of those custom tips were um, a little bit more diffuse because you entered the tip amount rather than entering uh, a particular percentage. So, um, the experiment included um, in uh, two conditions, no change in default tips, and in two conditions, um, the, this new default tip menu, uh, where the shift from dollars to percentages um, occurred at $35 instead of 25, and, and that um, change in threshold was motivated partly by inflation. It, it hadn't changed for 10 years since the, since the platform was introduced. Um, yeah, so a bit more convoluted uh, than most field experiments and, and not the one that we would have ideally run, and we knew that as we ran it. Um, we treated the full population of platform users. Uh, that included um, just over 40,000 people who had buyers who had used the platform before and almost 8,000 buyers who had not used the platform before. Um, the, the first treatment occurred um, when the buyer confirmed receipt of of the of the work and and so the 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 matching process between the buyer and seller was not affected by the treatment so that first exposure was truly exogenous if the buyer used the platform again during the sample period um, that could have been affected by by the tip request and and so buyers could self-select into repeated um, treatment and 
um, we're going to find pretty big effect, pretty big differences between um, new and repeat buyers in, in how these uh, treatments change tipping, and which is probably what you would expect, right? It, if, if someone's been using a platform for a while, it's going to be more difficult to convince them to change their behavior simply because they may not notice the prompt. Um, uh, also, because they, they, they've they established a behavior and, and it's probably more difficult to, to change something established than to uh, try to affect something um, that, that hasn't occurred before. So um, first, we're going to look at the new buyers. Um, this is the first traded transaction only. Um, this injunctive norm about uh, the fact that tipping, the platform believe tipping should happen, um, uh, raised um, the the proportion of buyers who tipped uh, quite a bit. The two treatments um, trying to motivate um, tipping with reciprocity uh, were were not statistically different from the control. Um, so so we we view this as as a first evidence. Um, using ecologically valid data that um, appealing to specific tipping motivations can change, tip, but um, we also have some null effects here as well. Um, we're gonna uh, use the observables that we have available to try to reduce the noise in the treatment effect estimation a little bit. Um, and, and so um, we're, we're gonna control for the, the buyer factors, the transaction factors and, and the seller factors that, that we can observe. Um, and, and we're going to do that in a, in a pooled sample where, where we use all observed transactions across the four weeks. And then we're also going to distinguish by each buyer's order number within the four weeks. Um, and uh, what we find is, is a point estimate that's almost the same as the non-parametric, um, but we only find a statistically significant effect upon the first exposure. Um, the the second and, and third transactions um, are, are not reliably different from zero. Um, we, we do find an, uh, a positive effect in the pooled data, but um, uh, it's smaller than that first exposure. Kwapner? Yes, so just, just clarification. So for on this platform, you tip before you actually receive the, the, the service. Uh, no, right. so, so you, you receive the service, you verify to the platform that the seller performed. And upon verification, they ask you to rate and then they ask you to tip. And, and okay. uh, the ordering, if, if you rated one star or two stars, they did not ask you to tip, um, which almost no one did. Where that's less than 3% of the data. And is history of tipping either on the buyer or the seller publicly available? Like if I'm a buyer and I tip or don't tip, is the percentage of transactions on which I tip available to sellers to look at? I believe no tipping information is available to anyone except the tipper and the tip receiver. Uh, but we observe full tipping data for calendar year 2019. Okay. And we control for that. Um, in at least some of our analyses, if, if not all of them. Um, so uh, we, we took a look using the same specification of to, to see whether um, to see whether these conditions changed uh, platform repatronage. Um, I, I thought econ training, right? Um, if I'm paying X amount more, maybe I'm X amount less likely. To, to purchase again in the future, um, we did not find that. Um, so uh, next up, and, and recall, uh, even though we're using the message labels um, for these treatments, um, reciprocity and norms uh, confound the change in default tips, and, and we're going to try to disentangle that using the, the post-test data in, in just a minute. Um, so uh, when we look at non-parametrics, we again find that norms increased tipping rate among people who had used the platform previously, but but um, the effect size was uh, far smaller, um, around two and a, two and a half or three percent. Um, in the non-parametric, uh, we're um, using the pre-treatment data, um, pooling it with the treatment data in order to estimate buyer effects and seller effects. 
because of this um, uh, descriptive evidence that, that buyer effects have a great deal of explanatory power um, for tipping. And um, we find uh, a similar pattern to what the new buyer data showed. We, um, there's a significant effect of um, uh, norm treatment on first exposure and in a smaller effect in pooled data, but, but no significant effect of um, norms after first exposure and, and no um, significant effect of, of reciprocity motivation. Um, again, we, we looked for um, effects of treatments on repatronage, and um, uh, we didn't find any. Um, so uh, this field experiment did something. Um, what caused it? Was it um, the motivation, or was it the default tips, or was it some interaction between those two? Um, and, and so... Uh, this is where we turn to the post-experiment data to try to um, see whether either or both uh, attributes uh, had an effect. Now, um, after the experiment ended, the platform reverted to the status quo message for all users, but it retained the new default tips for all users. So a bit of a quirk, which, um, uh, enables us to pull these two things apart. And, and there's two ways that happens. For, for users in the control condition during the test, they had two defaults plus a custom, and they went to three defaults plus a, plus a custom. So that's a, we can isolate the effect of going from two to three defaults within that treatment group. For users in the reciprocity and norms treatments, they had three defaults plus a custom both during the test and immediately afterwards, but they reverted from the reciprocity and norms messages to the status quo message. So there's no change in defaults, but there is a change in message. Now, the change in message may be different than the one um, estimated during the test because the messages are being taken away. So we're if, if there's any sort of order effect between the messages, it may be different going from the status quo to the norm than going from the norm to the status quo. Um, I, I have limited ability to, to um, say much about that, but, but maybe that's testable in online experiments. Um, but this uh, lets us isolate the effect of reciprocity and norms messaging um, from default tips. Okay. Um, can I ask a question? Um, would it be possible to uh, survey a set of Fiverr buyers and ask them if they remember what they were asked when they were asked to tip? Because that would kind of address potentially any carryover effects. So if people don't, if you give them a menu of things and like, which one did you see? And they have no idea, then it's pretty unlikely that there are carryover effects. Um, I, I'm going to show you some data possibly related, but I, I, I like that. Um, and, and, and yes, we, we still have the contact of the company. So getting them to do things is not easy, but it, it could be feasible. So I, I'm going to interrupt too real quickly. I have to leave for a class, but you said you're interested in theory. Let me just throw one theoretical explanation of what you're observing. Uh, when you tell people that tipping is normative, especially the first time, they may be surprised, uncertain. Uh, and that ambiguity and uncertainty and challenging of their existing conception makes them more susceptible to the suggestion. But the second and third times I've had time, I can look it up, I can, and, and so I think what you may be observing is kind of a heightened susceptibility because I've been, I was surprised with that normative message. Um, just a thought, uh, and I'm sorry I have to leave, but interesting talk. Mike, thanks for sharing that. We'll, we'll give that serious thought, and um, there's probably a lot for us to chew over <laughs> in, in looking into that sort of literature. Thanks. Um, 
Okay, so coming back to distinguishing defaults from messages, um, uh, for the control group, um, we find that changing from two to three defaults does increase tipping. Um, for the uh, for the reciprocity and norms treatment groups, we find that reverting uh, from those um, uh, treatment messages to a status quo message reduces tipping. Um, among the repeat buyers, we don't find significant effects on, on either account, and, and the null effects are, to my eyes, fairly tightly centered around zero. Um, so, uh, so, so we take this as evidence that, that um, for new buyers, both the scale and the message um, uh, affected behavior. For repeat buyers, we have very limited evidence that... that um, uh, that, that adding the default tips changed tipping much. Um, I, I don't remember what this looks like when we use amount tipped in place of tipping incidents, but but that's probably something that we need to do here. Um, I would expect the defaults to have a bigger effect on the amount tipped rather than whether someone tipped or not. Um, and then the, the, the final um, post-test platform change was about three weeks after the test ended. The, um, the, the data scientists finished their preliminary analysis and then the, the platform went to, um, uh, went to uh, the, the injunctive norms message for all users. Now we can't distinguish um, that change from seasonality. Um, but uh, if we look at new tipping rate among each weekly cohort of new buyers, um, it does the adoption of, of the norms message does correspond with a meaningful increase in tipping rates. Um, we also uh, need to take a look at the control users from the experiment and, and uh, graph how they uh, change their tipping across these weeks. Um, the statistical power to do that um, is, is not unlimited, um, but uh, th that's something that um, uh, is, is going to uh, further um, inform this comparison. So um, I think one or two more graphs and then we'll wrap up. Um, we're still working on the uh, longer term analyses and buyer moderator uh, analysis. Um, remember, so, so, so the treated buyers, um, they had to transact within this four week period in order to be treated as part of the experiment. And so, um, what I'm showing you here is, um, weekly tipping behavior by each of those four treatment groups, um, during the test. And then for, um, every week subsequent, uh, for the remainder of the year and, 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 you know, uh, norms treated buyers tipped at higher rates for a little while, and and then uh, past that, it, it's hard to distinguish um, much visual evidence of, of a higher tipping rate. Um, maybe that's because everyone was getting norms treatment after week 30. Um, uh, so um, we've, we've run some uh, regressions, and, and, and to sum up, a lot of um, a, a lot of regressions and into one slide. Um, when when we look at longer term effects of uh, treatments on other behaviors, like um, did you rate? Did you rate five stars? Did you tip again? Did you spend more? Um, uh, did you buy more? Uh, we find no significant differences um, between treatment groups in in these measurable outcomes. Um, I promised not to go past uh, 950. So I'm, I'm just gonna wrap up by saying, we think that we have um, reliable evidence that platforms can increase tipping rates, at least in the short term among new buyers by appealing to specific tipping motivations. Um, we, we don't claim that these um, are externally valid, but we do claim that more platforms um, should test uh, this tipping message, um, and we hope that we offer some some um, uh, uh, considerations uh, for evaluating those tests. Um, and 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 we believe that when we're done with the paper, we'll we'll have some good evidence on on what buyer uh, factors um, predict compliance um, with such a tipping request. 
Uh, so, uh, you'll do 10 minutes. Um, thanks, thanks for coming and, and thanks for your input so far. Thanks also for the talk. And I, I had a question here. I, you split consumers based on, or, or buyers, sorry, based on whether they're new or repeat buyers. Um, but you also sort of explain that uh, people use the website in different ways. Some people have to search a lot. Others might know maybe exactly what they need. And so they don't need to go through the menu of categories and sort of to, to find something, but they directly search for what they need. And I was wondering if you looked at that variation on the buyer side and maybe that sort of uh, uh, folds into the new versus repeat buyer uh, category, the definition, or maybe those are sort of different things. Because I'm thinking that the set of, like sort of the, the set of options available to me, the set of sellers available to me might also affect my expectation of how good the service will be and therefore maybe um, what I end up tipping. Um, if if I'm looking for something very specific um, and there's only one possible seller out there, that might be very different than if uh, I'm looking for something very simple. There are thousands of people who can help. I, I don't know. That's sort of what I'm thinking about. Thanks, Ralika. I, I I can't say much in that regard, other than we do observe the the repeated coincidence of buyer ID and seller ID, um, and and this is um, I think an important feature of of our um, search for moderators that 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 might um, predict when this effect is bigger or smaller, um, and and we'll we'll give uh, more thought to that um, because we, we what we haven't done is like repeated purchase within a, a, a certain product category as opposed to spreading purchases across across product categories. So so our measurement is limited, but but I I, I, I like your intuition there and, and I take your point. Thank you. Um, let, let me open it up to uh, questions or discussions also from uh, the broader uh, attendee audience. If you would like to join the panelists, please raise your hand and we'll promote you as a panelist. So, so Ken, in the meanwhile, I think interesting talk, field experiments are very hard to do. So, so congratulations on that. Uh, I think uh, I, maybe I missed this, but I think uh, you are going to do the moderator analysis. And I think that will be very interesting because, because with would ratings substitute for tips, maybe I, maybe I missed that part or not. Uh, is, is there, uh, is there basically different dynamics for tip and tip amount. So do I tip and tip amount? So for the people who tip basically with, with the with the norms, maybe the tip goes up tip amount, basically order size, does that change the any heavy implication? Obviously demographics, right? So customer demographics, since you have an international audience there uh, would, would would help. So I think that would be very interesting in understanding and enriching, enriching it, but I, I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks Raj, thanks for the input. Uh, we have one question uh, from the audience about um, th does this platform have a rating system and is the rating uh, reciprocal? Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, buyers rate sellers immediately before the tip request is made. I'm not aware that sellers rate buyers. Um, no, uh, for, we don't know the seller side information. It's possible. Seller might rate buyer, but in our data, we cannot observe it. I, I, I would be really surprised if sellers rate buyers and all the data we've looked at, we hadn't run across something like that, but but I can double check uh, with the company. Right. And the, the other, um, the other um, rating is, is before they get the tip or before they give the tip. Before they give the tip. Yeah. Can I, I have a question about your comparison between reciprocity and then norm uh, and then the norms? I'm thinking if I buy something, I'm reciprocating by paying the price. Like that's you're doing a job for me, and then I pay you for it. And so, I mean, reminding me that I have to reciprocate is seems like a tautology in this particular context, uh, or, or maybe I'm not. I'm not. I'm not getting it. and so to to say that the norm treatment worked but the reciprocity did not work. Um, I, I'm not. How 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 are you able to say that that reciprocity really um, is not coming through here, while people have already um, 
So, so um, I, I think that's a fair question. I, I, I think about it a little bit differently. Um, so the in this context, the buyers are typically entering some personal specific requirements for the job that they're commissioning. And, and part of the seller's uh, work is to uh, respond to those requirements with um, something that reflects the, the specific thing that um, was requested. And, and so I don't, I don't think it's discreet. Um, did you do what I paid you to do or did you not? I, I, I think there's some degree of how well did your output match my request? And, and, and there's probably some effort required by the provider in order to match, to understand, and then produce the creative work that, that reflects what was originally requested. So, so that's how I think about reciprocity. Um, and, and I do think that if you look at this data, in, especially in Mike's papers, like pe people often say that, that one of the main reasons they give money when they don't have to is, is to reward the person who, who, who provided. So I, I, I can see different arguments whether that could apply here or not, but based on the literature, we believed it might apply there and uh, found that it didn't. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> you just have much better intuition. Um, I mean, I, I think in some of the transportation literature, like what are we thinking about, right? Like I, I get in the Uber and I say, take me to the airport, right? And like, I get to the airport every single time, right? But, but I commission, you know, um, make me a logo and, and I might get something that I can use or I might get something that I just won't use, right? Um, so I, I think the job is more uncertain in, in, in this context. Um, but I, I, I take your question. It, it's a reasonable question. I, I, maybe we need to think more about that in interpretation. Just to clarify, if I get a logo that I don't, want to use uh do i still have to pay because my understanding on fiverr was that if you're really unsatisfied that you can ask them to redo it or you you have other uh, other other actions you can take yeah i mean so if they didn't do what um you paid them to do uh then then you would say that that the work was not delivered that was you know the work delivered was not what what was um requested on the other hand, suppose you didn't realize that you had some requirements that you should have put in there, or suppose you just don't like what came out, but it matches what you paid for. Um, I, I think it's a pretty high bar. To, I mean, maybe a maybe it'd be possible to say you didn't get what you paid for, right? But um, there is sort of an adjudication process, um, and and there should be some mechanisms in place to protect sellers. Um, and and I, you know, we're talking like fifteen dollar logo, like. It, you'd think a lot of people would just eat the cost if, if, yeah. And related to, I think related to this a little bit, um, well, I guess I'd start with different. Like, I feel like there is, uh, did you try looking at the decision of people to leave the default option or leave a different amount? Because the, the way I'm thinking about it, there is like three choices here in some way and they're ordered. One is just I say to tip or not to tip. If like I said to tip, I can choose a default or I can choose from the options. And I wonder, you obviously, for people who didn't tip, you don't know how many of them will keep it at default or will change. But comparing default to my choice of option gives you something about inattention, where if we think that defaults work, we are just, I didn't even bother to, to think carefully. Um, and in the same way, if I didn't bother to think carefully, I might never read the, the text as well. So I wonder if that can help. Because I guess part of the question, I guess, here is how much this behavior, we should think about this, uh, some like behavioral bias, so like this affected by the design versus how much it might reveal in my preferences. And I wonder if this can help a bit with that, just trying to separate out inattention from choice. Um, we can do that. Uh, we, we we haven't done that, but we certainly can. Um, uh, my initial sense is that the the um, uh, the unique defaults were mostly used at higher price points where people didn't want to pay twenty percent of two hundred dollars. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, we certainly can quantify that. And 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 um, I mean, my my implicit theory um, has been: um, Am I going to tip? 
uh, if yes, I'll take a look at the defaults or I'll enter a custom tip. Um, and, and so I guess for my, I've been more focused on that kind of top line of incidents, but um, it's certainly not all the information that we have or, or the only means by which these things can operate. Um, because mm -hmm. remember, I mean, it's like, it, it's 92% of the buyers uh, don't pay a tip. Um, and and I yeah. think it's around 60% uh, of the buyers who are confronted with the tip request. Um, so, uh, but, but but certainly we can we can quantify that, and, and I think we need to do a better job in general of of, of, of linking the the amounts um, and the percentage uh, and 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 the default usage outcomes uh, to the treatments. We can learn more that way. Got it. Yeah, and it's it's how you also have this kind of change in number of options on the page. So I feel like there is this kind of cool different arm of this experiment where like it's advantage. So if there was a way to leverage the structure a little bit, would be helpful. And then just a second like remark, I don't have a good theory. I think you, it, it, not sure how much we can test this, but I think the result just that this new buyers on the on first occasion, they respond and later they don't respond. It was hard, a bit hard for me to judge how much we just don't observe this new buyers in this time window. So it's like uh, the effects, the um, significance of the effects, the kind of the um, uh, standard error kept in initial tables was pretty similar for the first purchase, second, third, but I assume it's from the repeat buyers. For new buyers, I guess we might not know too much. They don't do this kind of uh, second, third visit uh, that much. Maybe it still will be also significant then. But I think this kind of this result would work on the first time and then I learn and I don't respond. If there was a way to learn more about that, that's really helpful. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, and, and everything I've presented here has been treating significance like it's binary or something. And, and you know, the confidence intervals are obviously the more informative uh, set of results. So we should probably, yeah, hear you. Thanks for the suggestions. And uh, just to motivate this uh, norm treatment being the one that works, just do like a quick uh, Google search. And there are so many Reddit uh, posts asking, should I tip, should I not tip on this uh, particular platform? So it does seem to be the one that people care most about in thinking about, you know, whether I should be doing this or not. And you can, you can imagine for the new customers, they're not sure. The first time they see it, you know, back to Mike's earlier point about being caught by surprise when they first make a uh, transaction, so they may just you know, go ahead and do it. And later, if they go online and search, and then there are many sellers out there saying, oh, I don't typically receive tip, or I, I get tip 10% you know, of the time, they may think they're getting kind of tricked by the platform. That may be like a, one of the reasons explaining kind of later, it doesn't really work anymore, the, the, the normalcy treatment. Yeah, so um, uh, thank you. Uh, that's really helpful. Two, two responses. One is that um, if, if we can observe a, a participant search for information about tipping norms and, and how that coincided with the treatments, um, that, that's a fantastic idea. Um, and uh, the, the second is um, something I was very uncomfortable with when we started this project, the difference between an injunctive and a descriptive norm. Um, this is a, a well-established uh, difference um, uh, in, in um, sort of the, the social intervention literature where the descriptive norm is you describe what happens uh, normally. The injunctive norm is you describe uh, what you think should happen. Um, and the, the language around each is uh, not so clear um, which type of norm is, is being expressed. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, this, this is, a, I think we're, we try to be careful to call this an injunctive norm. Um, but I, I, uh, yeah, um, confusion around this, uh, among participants of the platform, I, I, I could certainly understand. I can ask a question. Hi, Ken, a very interesting paper. So I, I want to move away from the norms and, you know, behavior things, but rather focus on the sort of quantitative side as a, as a, as a buyer. Why would I care about, you know, tips and so on? So I'm thinking about this like in, in two potential ways. So one way is that what's the probability that I match with the same seller again in the future, right? I mean, I think in restaurants, this is going to be very, very important, right? Because I always want to go to the same place. I want the person to remember me. 
So that's just like saves a lot of say, okay, you know, the the the, the server will decide, say, okay, how much effort do I put into this? So this is a truly repeated transaction. On the platform side, that's going to be kind of hard to do, right? I mean, you know, there's so many buyers and so many sellers. So I, that's the reason why I asked earlier, say, how whether how often whether it's indeed possible whether sellers actually uh, the, the sellers would rate buyers, and if they do, do they rate buyers after they observe the tips, right? So, um, right. So, so in the survey literature on tipping, uh, most people do not um, say that these future considerations affect their tipping decisions, which mm -hmm. kind of surprises me as well. My intuition, or maybe my training is different, um, but, but we do observe um, the, the repeated interaction between buyers and sellers. And so um, that's something we, we can look at um, as an outcome of, um, uh, so, so I, I think we have- When you look at repeated interactions, person. you're not looking at less than repeated interaction between the same buyer and same seller, right? That's what I had in mind. Like say if I hire this yeah. person, I really like what he or she did. Well, next time he or she, I'm gonna go to you know this person first, right? And then go from there. Saves a lot of like, you know, hassle of, of finding another match. Right. Yeah. I mean, we early on we looked at some repeat interactions between same buyer and same seller in the pre-experiment data. And we found the tipping rates were very low uh within, even though the the number of repeated interactions within certain dyads was actually fairly high, like more than 10. Um, but, uh, and, and I, I think that took us away from focusing on that, but I, I think we okay. need to return to that in order to completely describe the phenomena that we can observe. Um, and and I, I hear you, I think Ralika was asking a similar point um, with regards to buyer familiarity. Um, and so, I, I take that as a, as a suggestion that can help guide us as as we develop this further, and and I, 